for the opportunity I have to speak to you this evening. I'd like to take the next few moments we have to consider an overview of about the first three chapters of the book of Isaiah. We find in this book where the prophet Isaiah is denouncing the people of Judah, in Isaiah chapter 1. We see that this wickedness is spanned from the reigns of Uzziah through Hezekiah. And that Jerusalem had become so corrupt that God labeled them rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah, chapter 1, verse 10 of Isaiah. Through this prophet, God called the people to reason with him concerning their sins and the remedy for them. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. However, this people persisted in their wickedness, their evil ways. Chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, which reads, How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow cometh unto them. Thus God is seen then to make promises of judgment and renewal throughout the remainder of chapter 1, which brings us to chapters 2 through 4. Throughout these chapters, it is revealed to us three different perspectives of the city Jerusalem. So this evening, I would like for us to consider those perspectives. In Isaiah chapter 2, we're presented with the polluted Jerusalem. In verses, or cha again, chapter 2, verse 5, through chapter 4, verse 1. In verses 5 through 10 of Isaiah chapter 2, we get this picture. <clears throat> Excuse me. O house of Jacob, come ye. And let us walk in the light of the Lord. We see the contrast that the plea here was for them to be faithful to God. However, the focus turns from the people and addresses to God. Verse 6, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of God, excuse me, the house of Jacob, because they replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there in any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. Their worship the work of their own hands. That they which with they which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down. The great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. So as we said, verse 5 points to the plea for Judah to walk in the ways of righteousness, to walk in the paths of light. However, Isaiah turns his focus in addressing God and pointing out the flaws that are persistent in the city of Jerusalem. We notice that God forsook Judah, but we know why he did, and that is Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, as well as verse 12. We see in verse 6 that this, this people turned to soothsayers. They put their trust in wealth, that is the silver and gold, and they put their trust in horses and chariots, verse 7. They even turned to idol worship, verse 8. Thus, we arrive at what this people deserves, and that is complete humiliation. Isaiah makes the charge, forgive them not, in verse 9. Then we see in verses 11 through 22, where God's judgment is introduced, 
specifically verse 12. The thoroughness will be shown to them, verses thir or, yeah, 13 through 18. And the terror there is to be thus noted, verses 19 through 21. It is pointed out then that specifically Jerusalem, but obviously no one should put their trust in mortal man or his machinations. Then it points to the, the fullness of the judgment given by God. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, which reads, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. This shows the depth and the fullness of the judgment that was to come upon Jerusalem. That even the bare necessities, the resources that mankind desperately needs, water and bread, would be taken away from them. These, if you'll notice, were curses promised to the people if they ever rebelled against God. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 25 and 26, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 through 57. These curses would be brought upon Judah through, through the armies of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's armies would eventually lay siege to Jerusalem. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The famine that was brought about this great siege was so severe that men and women ate their own children. They ate their parents and even ate their mates. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 9, Lamentations chapter 2, verse 20, and chapter 4, verse 10, and Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 10. <clears throat> God used Babylon to remove from Judah all that they sought after and relied upon. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 2 through 7. Which brings us to the next perspective of Jerusalem, and that is the purified Jerusalem. Pictured there in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely, and from them, for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof, by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from the storm and from rain. At this point, Jerusalem had been purged. The idolatry was removed from Israel through the various enslavements, and a remnant remains there in Jerusalem. Now, obviously, the passage that we just read is a prophetic reference to the Messiah. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, and Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 15. Since the purification of Jerusalem had been completed, the blessings now could be given. These blessings would be given to the inhabitants of Zion. This remnant would bring the world its Messiah, which brings us to the third Jerusalem, and that is the perfected Jerusalem, found in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat>
the word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations, not nations, shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In verse one, we see that this vision that Isaiah had was certified by God. Thus the message is from Jehovah God. This perfect city was described verses two through four. Now it must be pointed out that this would take place in a future time and setting the last days, that is the messianic period. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. God's house would be established on the earth. This mountain built in the mountains, verse, verse 2, as well as Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And all nations, not just the Jews, would flow unto it, verses the latter part of verse 2 and verse 3. Christ, the sacrificial lamb, fulfilled the old law. Thus, in the latter part of verse 3, a new law would be given. And this new law would be given on Pentecost, for it is the, the message that the apostles preached in Acts chapter 2. Jeremiah foretold of this new covenant, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Thus, we have the establishment of the church. Consider these different points regarding this house of the Lord. The right time had come for its establishment, that is, the latter days. Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. This house was built in the right place, the tops of the mountains, Zion in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 12, and Acts chapter 2, verse 14. It was under the proper or the right circumstance, the issuance of God's word, the gospel of Christ, Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through verse 40. The right people were involved in its establishment. All nations, both Jew and Gentile. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And Acts chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 39. The right result thus followed. People were told how to gain entrance into this new house, the church. After all, we see that 3,000 souls were added to it on that first day. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and verse 41. Thus, the right institution began. The kingdom of God, Jehovah's house, the church that Jesus died for and paid for with his blood. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 47. <clears throat> Outside of scripture, we never saw the polluted Jerusalem, nor have we seen the purged Jerusalem, as described by the prophet Isaiah. However, all members of the church that are alive today and have been alive since its establishment are members of the perfect Jerusalem that Isaiah wrote about. Unfortunately, we have witnessed spiritual pollution in that great city, Jerusalem. Think about how many different faithful churches, different congregations of the Lord's people have gone astray. I know in my short period of existence on this earth, several churches have, have gone to the side, left or right. They're no longer following God's word. And that's just been within the last 15 years. How many churches, that is, counterfeit churches, are in existence, thus fracturing 
into different denominations, different cults, and even now trickling down to community churches. More and more, the doctrine of Christ is being replaced by feelings and entertainment. Ultimately, spiritual Jerusalem will be purged in judgment, along with the rest of the world. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Only those who have been added to this perfect Jerusalem, the church, will escape the fiery judgment of the wicked. Of course, if they remain faithful. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. It is this faithful group that will enjoy the blessings of eternal salvation in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, and verse 28. So let us, as the Lord's faithful, press on towards the mark. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. May we also take note of the polluted Jerusalem that we have discussed tonight. History is for us to learn from, especially inspired history, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The same lusts, the same false securities that they were ensnared by, spiritual Jerusalem can follow in the same trap. The soothsayers, those with itching ears, can fall a victim to false teachers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Riches, they, they can be taken away at a moment's notice. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, as well as verse 24. Physical armies, military groups, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 and idols, and that is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34, and James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Either of these four categories can ensnare the Christian. We must guard ourselves from that happening. So I hope this study has been helpful as we've considered the different perspectives of Jerusalem of old when compared to Jerusalem of today. Thank you for your time.